At a Success Academy charter school in Harlem, every student seems fully engaged with the work at hand. The teachers are in full command of their classrooms, and even the halls and lunchrooms are relatively orderly and quiet. Windows exploded, beams crashed, and trees split. This is a branch of the nation's most celebrated and controversial charter school network, where the kids beat the rest of the city on the annual standardized English and math exams by an enormous margin. What you've accomplished, and I want Success Academy's founder and CEO is Eva Moskowitz, a former city council member who sank her own political career back in 2003 by speaking out about how unions stifle schools. In 2006, she started a charter school. A decade later, Success has grown into a network of 34 schools, serving 11,000 kids. And it's often hailed as a shining example of what the school choice movement can achieve at its very best. And that shows that she has no hesitation and she really wants to get out. And This month, Moskowitz received the 2016 Savas Award for public-private partnerships from the Reason Foundation, the nonprofit that publishes Reason Magazine and Reason TV. And we sat down with her at that event for an interview. One of the core ideas of a charter school is that it's partially insulated from politics. Oh, well, I'm not sure <laughs> that has any uh, bearing on reality. You know, the unions are constantly suing us. The unions blockaded the entrance to our schools a number of years ago. It's just, you know, the, the mayor threw out three of our schools. I mean, it's been a, just a constant battle to provide this critical service. In the last nine months, success has been rocked by a barrage of negative stories in the press. Go to the calm down chair and sit. A low point occurred in February when this video, which shows first grade teacher Charlotte Dial berating a student and tearing up her work, was published on the New York Times' website. It was surreptitiously recorded by a former assistant teacher. Critics said the incident was indicative of a no-excuses culture that can be emotionally destructive for young children. The day the story appeared, Moskowitz held a press conference. I can't stand by as the New York Times uses selective video, anonymous sources, and gotcha tactics to tear down any teacher let alone one with the track record of Charlotte Dial. You said that the paper had failed to give Success Academy a fair shake. Why would the New York Times not be giving Success Academy a fair shake? While Charlotte Dial did the things on the video, it seemed as if there was a double standard because in the New York City school system, you have teachers engaging in physical abuse of students, you have teachers engaged in sexual abuse of students, and yet somehow that was not a front page New York Times story. If someone had videotaped me as a parent every moment, <laughs> of my 16-hour day with my children, I might not come off so well. We all have bad moments, but then the question is, why was this student teacher recording her in the first place? Because I think she was angry um, with Ms. Dial, and she held on to the video. So if you were really concerned about the treatment of a child, you wouldn't wait 15 months to bring forth the video. But look, the incident was troubling to uh, certainly Ms. Dial, certainly to all of us, but it's forced us to have an honest conversation about what kinds of practices are ineffective. Um, and I don't think the guardrails are totally clear to all teachers. And now we have an example. This is not what we do, and here's why we don't do it. I was doing what I thought I needed to do to fix a school where I would not send my own child. The other major controversy came last October, when again the New York Times broke the story that a principal at a success academy in Fort Greene maintained a secret got-to-go list, naming 16 kids with behavioral problems that his staff should encourage to leave the school. Moskowitz had reprimanded the principal immediately upon finding out about the list before the story leaked to the press. And she has long rebutted claims that success weeds out difficult kids. We responded incredibly quickly, incredibly swiftly, incredibly thoughtfully. 
Then in January, 13 families filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education, claiming that Success Academy encouraged their kids to leave, many of whom suffer from severe behavioral and emotional difficulties. Let's just say the worst allegations are true. She is counseling out the hardest to teach. Uh, she's creating this poor man's private school. Why is that a bad thing? That's Robert Pondicio of the education think tank, the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. He argues that these charges are hypocritical because top shelf neighborhood public schools routinely counsel out difficult kids. Are we saying that if you are a poor black and brown kid, it's a problem that you should have what an affluent kid in the Upper East Side has, a disruptive, free, studious, high quality school? Why is that unfair? A lot of the criticisms basically boil down to you push out kids, you're selective, the gotta go list, it's the same stuff, you cream. What's wrong with being selective? The parochial schools in New York are, are mostly are gone or they're much smaller than they used to be. Why can't success be selective? What's wrong with that? Well, I think there's a difference between um, should there be a level of selectivity, and, and of course there is in the public school system, in the district school system, right? If you're able to afford an apartment in the PS6 Absolutely. catchment area, I don't know what selectivity means if it doesn't mean that you have to have a certain income in order to go to that school. Absolutely. You could also argue that the gifted and talented programs, obviously, that is selective. Yes, so, but when you look at the scores in a very wealthy area, you know, PS321 in Brooklyn, you're going to see high scores, and everybody knows that a big factor is demographics. Success Academy, it's a largely minority population from poor backgrounds. Why can't they also get a classroom filled with other kids who aren't going to disrupt the flow of the class? Well, you know, there's the philosophical why, which I suppose is your interest, but that's not how charter schools are set up. And we are following um, the rules of random lottery. So that is the only basis upon which you can select. You know, we're a random lottery school. But are you school. working within the confines of that rule? I mean, you know, it's yes, like... Yes, we are. We what, are working. So maybe other tactics for selectivity might actually serve your student population. I mean, it's, it's like one of the pieties of education is that every classroom can serve every kid, but actually a really disruptive kid steals time and attention away from the other kids in that class. I think that that can lead to pernicious effects where a school is deciding this kid can, this kid can't. We want to serve a very broad, we're not a gifted and talented program. That's not our mission. Our mission is to be an old-fashioned uh, public school where you serve the community. Like all charters, the students here apply by entering a random lottery. And demand is strong. Success received more than six applications for every opening at its schools next year. But compared to 2015, the number of applications actually fell slightly for the very first time. Does that have anything to do with some of the negative press? I don't really think so. I mean, it was 20,000. We have 20,000 parents on our wait list for 3,400 spots. Uh, I'm not terribly... But it had also grown every year prior. Yeah, quite different bit, neighborhoods are different. Yeah. You know, we, we're opening up a school in Far Rockaway. We're very new to that community, so so it wasn't a seeing of the years. Charlotte Dial video, reading about the gotta go list that scared any parent. Said to a small percentage, even of parents who said, "No, I'm going to look elsewhere." That's not my impression uh, from doing a lot of parent meetings. You know, when you have um, parents on the ground, that's not. You know, most of most new applicants find out about success from a fellow parent. And our parents' experience of the schools did not feel like the portrait in the New York Times. Do the and they're the ones like do they do the parents you talk to, do they like the idea of a more disciplined, orderly, safer environment than they might get at their district school? Well, I would say first they find the school incredibly joyful. Some of that joy was on display at a recent Success Academy pep rally that had nothing to do with sports. This is the annual Slam the Exam gathering, in which students get revved up for the upcoming state standardized tests and honored for their past achievements. The difference between successful people and less successful people is that they don't shut down, they power through. 
The regular public school, the big story is parents dropping out. My kids shouldn't take the test at all. It's success, it's almost like a football rally. What's the idea behind that, that event? Well, the idea is just, you know, why should there only be pep rallies for sporting events? We want to celebrate their growth. They've worked hard. You certainly didn't get the sense of kids who feel ostracized for doing well in school. No, no. Moskowitz, who has long maintained that one day she'll return to government and run for mayor of New York City, is evolving in how she defines herself politically. When we sat down with her in 2014, here's how she described her views. I'm a liberal. I think that liberals care about the little guy. Liberals care about social justice. At the Reason Foundation Savas Awards earlier this month, she sang a different tune. I called myself an FDR liberal. I believed in big government uh, until I met it up close and personal. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't naturally a libertarian. Uh, in fact, I resisted uh, becoming one. Uh, but uh, the more time I spent in government, uh, the more I began to doubt whether it really was the public-spirited institution uh, that it claimed to be. How about other than your belief in, in school choice, though? Are you l more libertarian in other ways as well? No. Not particularly. No, maybe if I knew more about those other areas, maybe I, I would be, but I don't really know that much about health care. It's a relevant question because you have not been secret about, going back years, that a, a career goal of yours was to be mayor of the city of New York. And then you're not just the, not the chancellor of the Department of Education, but the mayor of the city of New York, you announced in October that you were not going to run against Mayor de Blasio for next term. Um, well, I mean, first of all, is this still an aspiration of yours? Yes, I, I might do it in the future, um, but so I'm you don't have you don't have your policies on other aspects of city government. I mean, I I did. I I sat on the finance committee when I was in city council, and um, you know, I sat on land use and transportation and so forth. You know, the last few years I've been pretty exclusively focused on uh, public education and public policy. Over the next decade, is success going to keep, can we expect a hundred schools? Um, do you, yes. Are you going to, yes, do you have it in, are you, you still going to be leading success a decade from now? I don't know, a decade from now, but, but for the foreseeable future, this is, you know, it's a, it's a, enormous project and it is going to take a tremendous leadership to get it done and I have an incredibly talented team of people uh, who I want to support in order to break the educational sound barrier. Will you move to other cities? I don't anticipate. There's, there's a lot of really lousy, a lot of lousy schools right here in New York. Okay, well thank you Eva. You're welcome, thank you.